give a roaring welcome to Miss Robin. Three 
country of origin? Religion? That cluster back there? Personality? Language? Size? Social class? Etc. 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 So intersectionality is the idea that every single person has many different categories of identity. And it's the idea that each one of your identities affects the way in which you experience each of your other identities. And I think that's something that people forget. And so what that means is that every single person who identifies with a specific word, so like every single person who identifies as bisexual, for example, is not all the same. Because each of those people is a different combination and mix of different other things. And each of those other things affects the way in which you experience your sexual orientation. And let me just ask you a question. So I identify as bisexual, and sometimes I play this game that I call the intersectionality game. I think it needs a better name, but we'll work with that, right? So I play this game that I call the intersectionality game, and I think, think to myself, how would my experience, for example, of being bisexual be different if one of my other identities was different? What if instead of identifying as a woman, what if I identified as a man? Do you think I'd have a different experience of being bisexual? And what if instead of being middle-aged, which is, by the way, one of my newer identities. <laughs> this is true. Last year, I sat down and I did the math. And I thought, oh, <laughs> I'm middle-aged. So what if instead of being middle-aged, what if I were a teenager right now? Do you think I'd have a different experience of being bisexual? Yeah. yeah. How different? <laughs> really different. I would have had the internet. I do not have the internet. There are so many different ways that it would be different. And what if instead of growing up in New York City, what if I had grown up on a farm in rural Montana? Yeah. <laughs> and what if instead of growing up in a family that was very left-wing and social justice-y, what if I had grown up in a very, very politically conservative family? Do you think I'd have a different experience of coming out? Yes. So for me, this is intersectionality. This is how it plays out. What if instead of growing up in the US, what if I had grown up in Korea? Or Uganda? Or Turkey, or Afghanistan, or anywhere else that's not here. For me, this is intersectionality. This is where you need to understand that when you meet someone who shares one of your identities, sometimes we do that. Like, I used to do this too. Like, I meet someone who's identified as bisexual just like me, and they say, oh, cool. I'm bisexual, you're bisexual, we're bisexuals, yay. And I would think that, that meant that we had the same bisexuality, that we understood it in the same way, that we experienced it in the same way. But now, when I meet someone who shares my sexual orientation label, I think, isn't that exciting? We share an intersection. We share, an, maybe we share more than one. But for me, that's now this like exciting moment where I think we share this thing, but I don't think we share everything necessarily. And I think for me, understanding intersectionality has started to make me able to see other people more clearly. Because I don't assume that we all have the same experience. I don't assume that we all have the same perspective. I now try to assume that we don't. And that that's a good thing. And that that's a thing that makes us more interesting and more fabulous and more beautiful. Does this make sense? So what was the word I just told you about? <laughs> try to remember that in every single interaction you have. You know, I used to think I'd be someone else who identifies. Raise your hand if you identify as a woman. I used to think, oh cool, I'm a woman, you're a woman, we're all women. That can be experienced in many, many different ways, right? And so now, we share an intersection of awesomeness. Um, and to move forward together, I think to really make good social change, to really make, make, make this world a better place, we need to never forget that. That's something that we have to like, think about all the time. We need to see each other in, in our completeness, in our entirety. And, and also about identity, no one ever should be told, no one should ever be told there is a correct way of being your particular identity. Raise your hand if anyone has ever told you that you were not doing one of your identities correctly. You know what I have to say about that? It's wrong. There is no correct way to do an identity. No one should ever be telling you you are not doing your identity correctly. You are you. If you're doing your identity the way you do your identity. And yet, oftentimes, people do try to push that on us. So I would just say, throw that in the trash. And you know, it's our challenge, I think, to work together across all of our differences. And 
you know, to create this beautiful social justice tapestry of like, fabulousness. You know, to really work with the differences, to see the differences as a good thing, and to try to figure out like, how do you negotiate that. And by the way, is it always comfortable to work across difference? There's an ex there was a quote from, I think it was um, Bernice Johnson Regan who said, if you're in a coalition and you feel like you're too comfortable, then you're probably not in a broad enough coalition. You know, this kind of work is not easy, but it is important. It's what we have to do. And you know, what that means is that we need to remember that every single person brings something valuable. Every single person in this room brings something valuable to the conversation. Every single one of you has something important to say. So what does that mean we need to do? We need to open up our ears, we need to open up our minds, and we need to just keep on remembering to take the time to listen to each other. And sometimes that's the quiet person who doesn't usually say very much. One thing I've learned as a workshop facilitator is that sometimes in the room there are quiet people who don't say anything. When I talk to them later on, I am sometimes amazed at how much they have to say and how much importance they have to teach me. So let's listen to each other, not just the noise of people like me. I am. But also the quiet people. Now I want to talk a little bit about change. How does change happen? How many of you, how many of you think the world needs to change a little bit? Yeah, it needs to change a lot. So how many of you, so the question is like, how does change happen? And when I think about change, change happens because somebody looks at the way the world is and says, you know, the world does not have to, what did I just do? <laughs> Okay, good. So somebody, change happens because somebody looks at the world and says, the world does not have to be this way. The world can be different. Somebody uses their imagination and they imagine the world different than it is right now. And then they come up with a strategy and they make change to make that world a better place. That's, what, that's how change happened. And I now think of, of activists as cultural artists. We are artists of culture. We think of the world as it is, and then we imagine how it could look differently, and we take steps to create that different world. We create, create steps to make a new place that nobody has imagined before. Um, and by the way, change is happening. Change is really happening. We are in this absolutely amazing moment where the world is changing in rapid ways, and I think especially in regards to LGBTQ plus people. I think in regards to gender and sexuality, we are getting, we're starting to get a lot smarter. Starting, I said. <laughs> we are starting to get a lot smarter. You know, I think it's so exciting to me that we are starting to understand gender in complicated, broad, amazing, non-binary ways. I think it's exciting that we're starting to understand that sexual orientation is more than just two possible categories. I think it's exciting that we are starting to understand all these things, finally. And there are things that we know now, culturally, that 10 years ago we had not even imagined. And here's one thing I want to give you, which is that in 10 years, there are going to be things that we will figure out then that we haven't even imagined now. So I want to challenge all of you to think about what those things might be and start imagining them quickly. You know, making them happen a little bit sooner. I think we're in this absolutely amazing moment of possibility. And it's kind of exciting, it's kind of scary, but it's so full of possibility, and we are the people who are gonna push that forward. We're, gonna, we're the people who are gonna make the world a better place. Who's in with me? <laughs> you know, and just think about constantly pushing yourself, constantly challenging binaries. Every single time you challenge binaries, every single time you use inclusive language and images, every single time that you make space for complexity, every single time you think and act in an inclusive, intersectional way, you are engaging in an act of healing. You are expanding vision. You are putting more oxygen into the room. You are creating, for yourself and for other people, more space to be complex, more space to be complete. You are being the change. Every time we do that, we are moving the world forward. So let's grow our communities, and let's also think about expanding our circles of safety. Everyone who's in this room has managed to find
find at least some sort of space where they can feel pretty, pretty okay, like your GSA, yes? Yes. But what our challenge then is to not only support our own GSAs and places like that so that we can find safe space, but I think we also need to expand the circles because the more people we can bring into these circles, the safer we're gonna be. You know, we need to keep on expanding the circle of safety until we don't need separate space to feel safe. And that means engaging in conversations with people who aren't already in the room. That means making a commitment to be educators. That means making a commitment to have conversations with people who seem to have not a clue. Yeah, that means being patient, persevering, doing it over and over, sticking it out, because the more people we can bring into our circles, the safer everyone's gonna be. And one of the things I wanna leave you with is a commitment. You know, I commit. Have you ever heard that expression, you are the future? Yeah. Yeah, I hear it all the time. Well, not about me. <laughs> <laughs> but I hear it all the time. And one thing I wanna say to you is that you are the future, but you're also the present. Your power is not something you're going to have someday. You have power now. And so I'm not saying to you, you're, you are the future and someday it's all these problems are all gonna be yours. What I'm saying to you now is you are the future and you are the present and I am the present and I am the future and I'm not going anywhere. But I'm hoping that together, all of us across generations can work together to make the world a much, much, much safer, much, much more beautiful, much, much more richer, much more intersectional place so that we can all get the work done because that's the way we're gonna get it done is together across generations, every single person. So I recognize your power and your value and your importance right now. I see you, I hear you, you're really important. And you and I and everybody else in this room Let's go out there and change the world. Thank you so much. Uh, how did you came to the conclusion that you were different from everybody else? <laughs> how did well, I come to the conclusion that I'm different from everybody else? How did you realize that you were a lesbian, bisexual? I think I realized I was bisexual the way that a lot of people do. I had a crush. Oh. <laughs> you know, I grew up, I think one of the things that's really important to remember is that we grew up in a culture where the presume, where it's presumed. Your mic's not on! I didn't know that. Together we're better. Thank you. <laughs> I don't recommend 
and then going back in the past and coming out dancing. <laughs> is it hard now? It is hard now, but it was really, really differently hard back then. It really was. It was horrible. All right, we have one back here. Thank you. Sorry, let me stop. <laughs> okay, so what do you say to those people who say bi guys can't be bisexual? I would tell them, first of all, to read the anthology that I edited, which has 70 different bisexual identified guys telling, telling their stories. Um, I think it's interesting because I feel like people, people are really disrespectful of identities that are different from their own. And people have a really hard time imagining realities that are different from their own. There are so many men who identify as bisexual, and I know a lot of them. And I guess what I would want to do is like carry one of them in my pocket and say, when someone says bisexual men don't exist, I'd like to pull one out and say, here, talk to this one. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I think that most people think that there are far fewer bisexual men and women and people than there actually are because most of us, when we think about other people's sexual orientations, we decide what other people are based on what we see. And if we see a man dating a man, what do we assume about them? They're gay. If we see a man dating a woman, but they might not be, right? But we don't see it because we make a lot of assumptions. And what's that thing I say about the word assume? <laughs> assume makes an ass out of you and me. A-S-S-U-M-E. And I think that's a lot of what's going on is people just don't see us because they're us, we're outside of their imagination and they are making assumptions. Hi. Um. <laughs> um, so what would you recommend for like people who want to get started in activism, especially in the LGBTQ plus community? I love that question. <laughs> it does, it makes my heart warm. I guess what I would recommend to people who want to get started in activism is volunteer somewhere. Volunteer somewhere. Like, what state are we in? We're in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has a statewide equality group called? Uh, equality Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania also has, and by the way, you can get on their mailing list for free by just going on their website and signing up, and that way you can find out what's going on. Um, I would just get involved in things like that. You can volunteer with you know, pride marches. You can volunteer with your local community groups. You can volunteer with a lot of different groups. If there's an event and you're not signed up to go to it, you can just kind of call them up and say, hey, can I volunteer? There's lots of ways to get involved and volunteer. Organize things in your own school. Um, do a lot of, there's a lot of stuff you can do even on the internet with kind of posting and telling your story. I think one of the most powerful forms of activism is telling our own stories. That is so powerful. And raise your hand if you often don't see people like you in those stories that you read. The people who have your hands up right now, I really want you to especially think about telling your stories because if you told your story, then somebody else who's similar to you might find themselves and not feel so alone. So I think there's so many ways to do activism and, and writing letters to the newspapers, writing letters to the editor, there's so much stuff you can do and it's all powerful and it's all important. But I would say get involved and find someone to be your mentor. Find someone to volunteer with, like who knows what's going on, who's been around longer than you have, and ask them, like, hey, how do you do that? And how do I get involved in that? Can I come with you to that meeting? And by the way, bring people with you. Because one of the most powerful things about activism is multiplying yourself. If you go, that's awesome. If you go and you bring one more person, that's twice as awesome. If you bring two more people, that's at least three times as awesome. Um, oh, um, I, um, so myself, I have been like bullied in the past before. I mean, I know obviously it would be different for you because Well, I didn't go through bullying when I was a kid because I wasn't out. But like ever? Yes. And I think one of the worst kinds of adult bullying is dismissing someone else's identity. When, someone sa when you say, this is who I am, and someone says, no, you're not, that is so disrespectful. I think that's kind of an adult form of bullying where it's, it's wrong. So yeah, I've experienced that so many times, and I've had so many times in my life when I felt like I needed to defend myself, and it's not OK. And I'm not going to put up with that anymore. It still happens, but now I'm just like, no, you have no right to um, tell me what I am. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
tell me who I am or what I am or what I should do. Um, I told people in the earlier workshop, I learned this great thing last summer um, from one of the campers at Camp Pride. She said, it's my identity, not your identity. It's identity, not you identity. You know, I am the best, who is the best judge of who you are? Me. Who is the best judge of your experience? Me. Who else has the right to tell you who you are or what you're feeling? That's my very specific family, because again, intersectionality, who your family is will also determine how, what your experience of coming out is. In my family, um, it took me a long time to tell anyone. I finally told my mom after five years, six years of knowing it myself. We were in my car, in, her, in my car, she was driving. It was my birthday. And in my family, there's a rule that you have to be nice to people on their birthday no matter how annoying they are. <laughs> And so it was my birthday, she was driving, so I thought this is a good time to tell her because she can't jump out of the car because she's driving. And she's probably gonna have to be nicer to me because it's my birthday. So I said, hey mom, there's something I wanna tell you mom. And she said, what? And I said, uh, mom, I'm bisexual. And she said, I knew that. <laughs> and what she ended up saying was, you know that time when you showed up at that music festival with that woman on her motorcycle? With the short hair, she said, I kind of got a clue. And I said, Mom, why didn't you say anything? And she said, I was waiting for you to say something. And I said, Mom, do you know how scared I was to say something to you? And I don't think she still to this day understands what kind of fear people have when they're thinking about coming out to other people. I don't think she understood that. Because I, I wish I had known. And by the way, I found out years later that one of her best woman friends is a lesbian. And had been since I was 12 years old. And if I had known that about my mom, do you think I would have been as worried about how she'd respond? No. So that makes me really sad still. Like I, I really wish that I had known that. Because I would have known that she was cool from day one. <laughs> Two more questions. One um, right here and one back here. Who was the hardest person to come out to? Myself? I guess myself, actually no, I was thinking with my dad. Because I think my dad was stuck in this idea like the only true love is the love between a man and a woman. <laughs> and he was really, I think he was really like having a hard time just even dealing with that idea. I think he saw my being attracted to women as somehow a threat to his heterosexuality. I don't know what he thought. But he, by the way, everyone in my family over time has come around 100%. So I, I also want to say that even though some people might have a not so good reaction when you first tell them, most people need time to process. Most people over time do come around. And so, so just if you're coming out to someone, give them a chance to say something stupid. Like they, well, they might. They might say something ignorant. They might say something stupid. They might blurt something out that doesn't make sense. They might have a hard time, but most people if you persist and stick with them, they will come around and they will, they will, they'll get it over time. Who was the last person, Lisa? Oh, right, 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 yep, hand up right here. Where? Right there, straight back, to the right. <laughs> Malik. Right there, right there. Oh. <laughs> How do you feel about bullying that goes on in the LGBT community against bisexuals, like gay people also, with lesbian people, bullying bisexuals for being either not gay or fake, being fake gay or something like that? That's a great question. So there's a term in sociology called horizontal hostility. And that is the idea that people who are in pain, people who are being oppressed, sometimes take their hurt out sideways on each other. And there's another expression that says hurt people hurt people. I think a lot of the tension that happens when lesbian or gay men are mean about trans people or when bi people get you know, excluded by lesbian or gay people, I think that's horizontal hostility and I think that's people taking out their hurt sideways. Is that constructive? No. Where should we be taking out our hurt? Uh, On the people who are actually causing the hurt toward us. But I do think that there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of pain and then when that comes out, I try my best to remember where it's coming from 
and that it's not rational, that it's fear, it's hurt, it's pain. Does that make sense? I try to be like my kindest, gentlest, most understanding self. Do I put up with crap? No. I will, I will speak back. I will speak back. But I don't think when someone does that, I don't think you're a horrible human being. I think you're in pain. But I'm not going to allow you to take that pain out of me, so let's talk. Let's have a conversation right now. And I guess that's my last question. Let's give Robin another round of applause.